This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, the retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. It's an all-pet day here on Creature Comfort, so the doors to our pet hospital are wide open. We're welcoming all pet questions, from the big to the small. Do you have a cat or dog at home, or maybe both? Do you have a question about exotic pets, like rabbits, snakes, or ferrets? Don't hesitate to join our conversation by phone or email. And always, if you have a general wildlife experience, a brush with nature, as it were, that you'd like to share with us, call in. To join the conversation, use this phone number, one eight seven seven. MPB Ring. It's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. And if you miss a Creature Comforts broadcast on Thursday, it repeats every Saturday morning at six. So good morning, Libby. Hope you're doing well this morning. Good morning, yes. Um, what uh, are you seeing in and around uh, your area lately? Oh, all kinds of good things. This is a great time to be seeing things, isn't it? Uh, it's hard to go in the house. Uh, enjoying the warm weather. Um, butterflies are starting to come out. And I think that if I looked up what we talked about a year ago, we probably talked about orange-tipped sulfur butterflies. And I'm seeing them again this year. They're usually one of the first things I see. I think I'd mentioned I'd seen a little blue butterfly not long ago. And uh, the two that that I was going to talk about a little bit this morning are also small, probably a little less than two inches across wing length. But they're showy because they're in the sunshine and they're enjoying the sun. Orange tip sulfurs are a, a pale yellow, as their name would imply, with bright orange tips on the wings. So um, not hard to see at all. They, uh, their host plants come out early, so they come out early, and they like to be in the sunshine. So you can look for those. And then pearl crescents are another little butterfly. They're orange and browns and yellows, a beautiful pattern. And, and tiny little things, and they're flitting around. They both um, overwinter as a larva that comes out early in the spring and um, enjoy their host plants. Uh, a neighbor of mine sent me a fantastic picture of a luna moth, too, that had just emerged. So it was, you know, when they first emerge and they've just pumped up their wings, that's the prettiest they're ever going to be. They haven't had to... Uh, dodge a bird or um, get caught in a briar. So they're really nice-looking creatures. If you can get a picture, that's the time to take your pictures. And um, Java just showed me a great picture of a mockingbird that he took. Yeah, I saw this mockingbird just right out of, uh, right outside MPB on a little stump. And what got me is because, you know, when you walk out, sometimes the birds will just fly away. But it sat there quite a while, and I was able to pull my phone out and get a real nice picture, a real great blue color. Um, and like you told me, just told me uh, it was a mockingbird. Yeah, and um, I saw a, a, a bird similar to a mockingbird, brown thrasher. I was... Um, I sat in the yard a lot this week. I guess you could call that wasting time, but uh, I think it's uh, it's something I need to do. But um, I was listening to um, a peleated woodpecker with the binoculars laying there, kind of half-heartedly seeing if I could get a good look at them. When I heard something in the leaves, I bet I bet it wasn't ten feet from me. It was kind of amazing, uh, especially kind of a brown thrasher. They're kind of secretive, and. Um, stay on the ground a lot and he was throwing leaves over his shoulders and obviously looking for something to eat and I really became a little concerned I thought maybe there's something wrong with his eyes because he would stop every now and then and I was started taking video of him he would stop every now and then and look right at me and make some little clucking sounds and move his head around and then go back to digging around for worms. And finally, I, I realized the video was getting way too long to post, so I reached over to cut it off, and he saw me just enough to hop away. But again, he just kept looking at me, so I'm hoping that there's 
I'm gonna. I'll look for them again to, when I get home today to see. And then, oh, I also saw a stinkhorn mushroom, which are pretty cool. You ought to look those up, and you'll know them if you see them in the woods. But um, this is the time of year, like I say, to get out. Uh, still seeing um, a lot of of uh, woodpeckers. And you usually hear those before you see them, which mm-hmm. is a great alert to grab your binoculars and start looking for them. Now, Libby, is it time for Purple Martins? Purple, is it time for a Purple Martins? Yes, it's probably still a little early, and I'm glad you mentioned that. That was like one of those telepathic. I've been communicating <laughs> with uh, uh, Emma, who does research on Purple Martins, and she's uh, got some new research that's just starting out this year. And then she wants to come on the show later to um, present her okay. research findings. So we'll be seeing, I guess, like towards the end of summer, I think, was what she was thinking about her in the fall. So she's going to, we'll, we'll, we'll learn about what they did this year. But a lot of people are waiting for their Purple Martins to come right now. I've never had Purple Martins, and she maybe she's going to convince me that I need some gourds. Um, a question, you know, yeah. sometimes when we talk about the colors of creatures, it's they're that way for camouflage or to, you know, to, to avoid uh, predators. With a butterfly that has sort of bright orange coloring, is that to attract other butterflies? I'm just curious if that's sort of the exact opposite sometimes of the coloring of other creatures we talk about. Yeah, there can be any number of reasons, and one certainly would be to attract mates. They don't make any sound. They can't attract their mates any other way. So that's, a, the, you know, seems to be the prevailing wisdom is that they they flash their wings in a certain way. Even some butterflies that are very cryptic, like those big morpho butterflies, the blue ones you see in the tropics, um, when their wings are closed and they're setting feeding on nectar, they just look like a leaf. But they can flash this iridescent, incredible bluish purple when they want to. So sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's because the things that they need to be afraid of, birds are, are of course, an enemy of butterflies because they're going to eat them. And they're going to eat the larva if they find it. And, you know, sometimes we're glad they ate the larva of a certain moth. Or, But usually, you know, their, their game, adult butterflies don't generally live or are not generally long-lived. There are a few exceptions like monarchs that, that um, have to have a sturdy enough body to make it. But so their bodies are kind of fragile. They don't some, you know, they basically don't eat much. And they, um, they're they just out as an adult to um, find a mate and, and lay those eggs. So attracting a mate is more important almost than hiding all the time. They've mm-hmm. got to find that mate and lay their eggs. And then the rest, no matter how long they live as an adult, then that's just kind of serendipity. So when you have a short time around, you need to get done what you need to get done. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Uh, here's a reminder, this Saturday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. is the Fossil Road Show. It's back at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, back in person. Everyone's encouraged, though, uh, to attend and bring their fossil discoveries. For more information, you can go to the uh, Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks website. That's mdwfp.com for more information about the Fossil Road Show. And just to add one more enticement to go that day, uh, right before the Fossil Road Show, the Jackson Audubon Society is leading a bird field trip in LaFleur's Bluff State Park on the trails behind the museum. Okay. So we're planning to do both, go walk the trails and then go inside at 10 o'clock. Full day of activity for uh, this Saturday. Uh, we got a couple of callers to get to, so let's begin. Our friend Sue has called in from Beaumont. Good morning, Sue. You're on the air with us. Good morning. How's everybody? Good. What do you have for us today? I, I want to have a wildlife sighting experience, and, and also I want to ask a question about pets. But first, I, I, I was really surprised at least for once. Uh, last week I saw a plethora of birds out in the backyard. I was so happy to see a, a bluebird and a mocking birds all over and uh, a, a brown thrasher and I was surprised like maybe because they're usually so secretive I was surprised to see all kinds of birds out flying around and, and it just they were having a joyful time out there and um so 
we're not deserted yet, Perry County. <laughs> <laughs> Sue, I'm so thrilled to hear that you've got your birds back. I've actually worried about that, and uh, I'm so glad you enjoyed them this week. Well, thank you. And I want to ask. I want to ask about pets. Okay. <clears throat> well, who in the United States government, or whom, allows the importation of, of, of species that are going to be invasive and harmful here in the United States? Why, why is that allowed? Like snakes and other critters, you know. Who, who allows that? Okay. There's good and bad, I guess, in this. Some. Um, some things, of course, hitchhike here, and everybody tries to stop them, and they still get through. And okay. I'm, this is, I guess, yeah. my opinion and not that of MPB, but uh, oh. the U.S. Agriculture Department, who does many wonderful things, has introduced a good many insects, and I, you know, I'm sure they always had a good reason, but uh, people, I don't know, there are, I guess a lot of scientists can't avoid or can't resist that temptation to try to find a biological uh, weapon to solve a problem, which is a, a worthy cause. Instead of using a, a chemical, we use another animal, but when it involves introducing a species, so many of those have backfired that I um, and that has been done at times, you know, by the federal government. Uh, Dr. Major, any thoughts yeah. on that? Oh, yes. And answer to the question, the Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service is very uh, front and center uh, with uh, trying to prevent the spread of uh, <clears throat> these particular pests and all. They have a list, I'm sure. On the other hand, as far as importation, uh, there are strict rules. Unfortunately, there's a lot of problem smuggling going in uh, with certain uh, reptiles, especially, and even in birds. So you have to be careful. Yeah, and you know uh, that's a problem going the other way, isn't it, Troy? We've talked about that before. Right. With again with reptiles, there are um, people that come and steal our rare turtles exactly. and snakes and sneak them out of the country and we have you know government officials trying hard to stop that uh so thanks for this go ahead dr it's pretty, it's, yeah it's pretty amazing but they they do a great job i agree with libby that sometimes things have been introduced uh that didn't need to be introduced uh as far as uh, uh insect control this sort of thing but most of the real severe ones are, are unintentional or, yeah. or, what shall I say, accidental. You take the uh, silver carp. Uh, that's one of those things that I'm not sure exactly. Libby, you know more about. Yeah, the silver carp. came from. Yeah. Definitely the fire ants. You know, and nobody wanted ants. those to be here. Right, exactly. So, yes, there is an effort uh, certainly to prevent uh, the introduction of exotic species, and there are regulations concerning that, but sometimes they get uh, brought in, uh, uh, unfortunately, by either accident or uh, intentionally. Yeah, there's an invasive stink bug that's here now that came in on imported plants. And even though those things are inspected, and I imagine they're inspected very rigorously, they, um, they have gotten in, and it's gotten to be a problem all over the country. Good question. I, I know, uh, I, go ahead. I had ordered something. Uh, it actually came from Thailand, and they uh, it was held up in, uh, I guess, in Los Angeles or somewhere because of the wood that it was packed in. They were concerned about possibility of beetles or something like that that could have been in that packing wood. So they, they're pretty up on trying to watch out for things, but at the same time, they're, th- they're telling them, how many different things get brought in that they don't catch. This is Creature Comfort. Sue, thanks uh, for your phone call. It's time for our first break of the hour. When we get back, we'll be looking for your pet questions for Dr. Major. Also, Libby's here, ready to talk to you about your recent brushes with nature. Call in with your questions and comments. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 or email animals at mpbonline.org. John from Tennessee has a cat question for us, I think. We'll get to that next. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major. 
and Libby Hartfield. Today, we're taking your pet questions and talking about your encounters with nature. If you want to join the conversation with a question or comment, the number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven. 672-7464. Email animals at mpbonline.org. Dr. Major, we've got John on the line from Tennessee with a cat question for you. John, thanks for holding on. It's your turn now, so go ahead. I have a cat that has a severe flea problem. We have spent over $100 on Capstar, and nothing good has come of it. What has left? Okay, uh, let me ask a few questions. It's an excellent question, and uh, it is this time of year. We seem to be getting more more and more flea problems. Uh, is this the only cat that you have? No, I have another cat. Okay, is it having a flea problem? <clears throat> Both cats need to be treated. No. Here's the thing. Here's the thing with Capstar. Capstar is very effective. It kills the fleas almost immediately and only lasts for about 24 hours, Capstar. So if there's a source of flea larvae, flea eggs, uh, certainly the cat could be reinfested very, very quickly. Uh, I would suggest treating both cats. There's a medication that seems to work really well, which is a topical called Brevecto, and it lasts for up to three months. So you might talk with your veterinarian about that. But it is a problem. Some cats are more sensitive. Is this a light-colored cat, or is it dark? Dark. A white cat. The lighter-colored cats seem to attract the fleas more for some reason than a dark cat, but that's not necessarily always true. Uh, the cat may have some other problems that may have severe allergy to fleas, and the, the other cat that you have may not have a, uh, that sort of problem. But I would talk to your vet. I would recommend something that uh, is known to work. As I said, Capstar only works for about 24 hours. All right, uh, John, so thanks, with that. thanks for your call this morning, John. Uh, Dr. Major, you know, on uh, our medical show, Southern Remedy, when we talk about medications, sometimes the answer is, well, we have a variety of medications, and this one might work better in your particular case than that one did. Is that true with pets, too, with their each different? So what might work well with flea control for cat A might not be as effective in cat B. Exactly. But just as I mentioned, it may be that that cat has specific. Some cats will go crazy with just one or two fleas, whereas other cats might have a dozen on it and not be causing them so much of a problem. Same thing is true of medication then. It may work extremely well on one cat or dog and not on the other. So you have to kind of pick and choose what's working for you, and you have to watch. Now, a lot of dogs and cats will scratch and itch, but they may not have fleas. You have to look carefully. So that's one of the things that uh, if the flea population is gone, they probably have some sort of allergy or other condition. All right, again, John, thanks for the call. And I will say I, I don't get paid by the company that makes Brevecto, but uh, it's been very effective on my cat. And so uh, I like it. And the fact is he hates me when I put it on him. And so the, the only have every three, three months or so is good because he he does not like he we are not friends for oh a good several hours after that. He'll run and hide. And uh, it's difficult. I, a friend of mine was helping me and I will hold the cat down and he, you know, squirts it on him. But Cats have that ability to do that sudden change movement, and, and half the time we wonder if, if I got more Brevecto on my hands than we got on the cat. But uh, it seems to be effective, so that's a, a plug uh, that I'll give for it for sure. Right, and your cat was probably gone away for a couple of hours, three or four hours, thinking of what it could do to get you back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the, my other observation, and this is probably not surprising, but I, I'm convinced the cat spends the entire time while I'm at work asleep because every time I get home, uh, he sometimes he, he wakes up quick enough and will run into the kitchen to greet me. But half the time, you know, he's just getting up and stretching from uh, taking a nap. So 
Uh, he spends his time well while he's at the home alone uh, napping. But again, they're cats, and that's what they're supposed to do. So speaking of cats, here is an email from Holly in Jackson. It says, I have a 10-year-old orange tabby female cat. Noticed recent patches of lost hair on her back legs. She's a frequent bather, so I assume that might be the reason. But are there potential other causes that I should be aware of? Great question. And, of course, one of the first things I would ask, are there any sores or, uh, you know, lesions on the cat's leg? It sounds like it may have an excessive grooming problem, and some cats do. They groom themselves excessively, and they can literally, we call it fur mowing, but they can literally shear hair off just like somebody had taken clippers and clipped the hair off. So I'm not sure exactly what uh, distribution of the hair loss is. But it may be that this cat has a, a bacterial infection uh, as long and possibly fleas. But this would be one of the things that you really should get in to see your vet and have them assess what's going on. Oh, here's another email. Libby, you might weigh on this one for us. It says, we found three totally empty turtle shells near our creek in the woods near a creek in South Warren County. What might have eaten them? Okay, that's always sad. Um, dogs and coyotes and can get into those shells if they work at it. A large dog especially can. They can they chew on it until they do. I'm sure it's kind of terrifying for that turtle in there to get rolled around and chewed on for a while. And uh, as protective as that case seems to be, it doesn't completely protect them. Uh, Maybe the other thing other thing with that, uh, we've talked about the uh, wild hogs. They're opportunists, and certainly they, they would have no reluctance in, in trying to break into that carapace. That's right. They could probably step on it and smash them even, couldn't they? Well, they got some strong jaws and yeah. big teeth. So yeah, they, they could, could Yeah, they could do that. Yeah. yeah, they could smash them one way or another with their feet or their jaws, I bet. All right, uh, here is another email. This one says... Um, My vet says that in her experience, white dogs in Mississippi suffer from allergies more than dogs of any other color, no matter of the breed. Some symptoms are itchy eyes, black discoloring on an otherwise pink stomach, runny eyes, etc. Have you noticed that and could you comment on that? We see a lot of allergies uh, with uh, just about any color dog. On the other hand, Having had a white dog, I can attest to the fact that, yes, around the eyes, especially uh, if they're outside, they will have some irritation. I always like to have uh, a white dog that looks like it's got eyeliner on because that protects the eye somewhat. Uh, Your cattle farmers know that uh, white-faced cattle have more eye problems than black-faced cattle simply because of the solar irritation and uh, can cause some real problems. Uh, the other thing, I think they are a little bit more sensitive, but it may be more breed-specific than it is color-specific. But, yes, I would say that we could make an argument that the white-colored dog uh, may have more skin issues. Same thing is true with the cat that I mentioned. I've mm-hmm. seen so many times that fleas are attracted to the white cat as opposed to the black cat. And some people may have call in and say, no, my black cat's got just as many or more than the white cat. But it does seem that it's more, uh, that the white color does attract the fleas more. Uh, this is Creature Comforts. We're going to take another break. You know, Dr. Major is on the air with us every week looking for your pet questions. But once a month, we devote the entire show uh, to your pet questions, and that's today. So if you have a pet question, now is the time to call in with that question at one eight seven seven mpb ring Our phone number, it's one 672 7464 You can always email the show as well. It's animals at mpbonline.org. Got another call on the line. We'll get to that after this break. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. It's an all-pet day, so we're looking for your pet questions. To join our conversation, give us a phone call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 
888-346-7464. You can email the show by sending it to animals at mpbonline.org. Back to the phone lines we go. First, we'll visit with Melody calling in from Tennessee. Good morning. You're on the air with us, so go ahead. Hello. Hi. This is Melanie. Go ahead. Um, so I have a question. Um, my, me and my dad made a bluebird house, and we put it up because we figured the bluebirds would be here soon. And, and about a week after we put it up, we saw some bluebirds, but they haven't been around in a few days. So I'm kind of wondering when would bluebirds start building in our house, like what time of year? I would say soon, Melody, in the next few weeks. But now they can do that. That said, if you don't get any in the next few weeks, don't worry. Leave it available and um, some, you know, because they re-nest all through warm weather. And other things may use your bluebird box if a bluebird doesn't. So, and I hope you're okay with that. Sometimes, uh, yeah. depending on where you put it, chickadees and tufted titmice particularly like a bluebird house. And if you're close to water and have prothonotary warblers, you might get those. But if you've got um, open area as your bluebird box in a place where um, there are not a lot of tree limbs around it or anything, kind of open yeah, space. It's, yeah, it's like kind of open on a pole in the yard. Yeah, if it's pretty open, that's yeah. that's what bluebirds like, and you've seen them going in there, that's a good sign. And one thing that will happen is they get interested in the box, and then we have a few cold days, and they kind of, oh, you know, not time yet. So as it warms up, they will get more and more interested in finding a place to lay eggs, to build a nest and lay eggs. So don't don't give up on them. Okay, thanks. Good luck. All right. I'm really, I'm really excited. <laughs> hey, uh, give us a call back if you get some and uh, tell us about your sighting. Okay, right. thanks. All righty. Thanks for the call. Good to hear from you. Let's move on next to Tupelo we go. Katie has called in today. Good morning, Katie. You're on the air with us. Hi, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Sure, go ahead. I have a six-month-old gold adore puppy, half golden retriever, half Labrador, and he was a shelter dog. We got him when he was four months old. Uh, I have tried feeding him all alone. I've tried hold, holding my the food in my hand and asking him to please sit before I set the food down. But no matter what I do, he eats like his food is going to be taken away from him forever. He's so voracious at eating. What can I do to calm him down? Great question, and this this does happen, and we've seen it, uh, which I'll say many times, from either dogs that came from a large litter of puppies, or from a shelter. And I think there's a, and he may have been on the street. Who knows? But my point being, they do act like they're voracious and like this is their last meal, often, and uh, it is difficult to slow that down. They do make some some bowls, uh, food bowls that that can get get can work uh, to uh, make it more of a challenge to eat. I guess is what I'm trying to say. It has the the food in a uh, what shall I say? Either a triangle with uh, knobs in it, where it really is hard for him to get hold of the food. He has to work at it. So. Keep working with him, and I okay. think you should be okay. Uh, it takes some time, but that is something that's kind of ingrained in him right now. And I've seen it quite often from shelter dogs or dogs that have been on the street. Hey, this is my last meal, maybe, and I'm going to take advantage of it. So work with him, and I think you can help with that, okay? All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Katie, for your phone call. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Major, is there a, sort of a added bonus of those type of bowls? Does it kind of sharpen the dog's, I don't know, problem-solving ability? Probably so. I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's a real problem, you know, to get the dogs to do that. But it does. Uh, and, they, and they also make some toys that you can either put peanut butter or some other uh, food in it that they have to work at to get some of that out. But... The, the bowls are designed, I think if you go online and look look for bowls like that, it would be basically to slow the dogs eating down where it's not eating. Uh, 
you know, gobbling it all down at once. Yeah, my brother's uh, has some of those uh, ones that the treats are inside the the toy, and his dogs just love to play with those. So uh, that would be something. And as as you said, I've seen those uh, bowls advertised online as well, to where the dog has to root around to get to the food, and hopefully it'll slow him down just a little bit. Here's another email, a dog email that says. My dogs are chewing frequently. Can't figure out the cause. They're all given topical flea tick medication monthly, uh, plus have a Soresto collar for added tick protection since we live in the country. I have numerous dogs, so food allergy would not be a probable cause. Uh, Many years ago, I had a little dog that had spring grass allergies. Could that be a likely cause? Certainly, and it can be, uh, you know, not just spring, but there are certain things in the fall that could cause allergies and skin issues. So I would say yes in answer to that, but also certainly could be most any time of the year, depending on the sensitivity of the dog. All right. Uh, We've got a caller to get to. Janice has called in from Moss Point. Good morning, Janice. You're on the air with us. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. I have a two spoiled rotten dogs, <laughs> and uh, they both uh, lick their paws, all throughout the year, and I've checked their feet, and I can't see anything wrong with them. And so I'm wondering, why are they licking their feet so much? Right. And there will be a whole host of answers to that, and uh, I don't know that there is an absolute. Are they damaging their feet by licking, or are they just licking? They're just licking. Uh, Right, and they have their hair there. They don't have any sores on their feet. That's right. They look normal. Right, and I would suspect that some of this has to do with grooming. Now, why both of them are doing it, I'm not quite sure, but a lot of the dogs will groom themselves almost like a cat would groom their feet. The other thing that you might consider is adding a good quality vitamin uh, to their diet, and you may already have done this. But sometimes a vitamin that contains zinc may help with that uh, particular problem. There's a good, several good uh, canine vitamins on the market that you could get. You might try that and see, okay? Thank you, I will. And I have um, another question. Okay. Um, my one dog every now and then gets like a itchy rash around their, um, under their nose, around their lips where it appears okay. that they've lost hair, but when it, when that irritation goes away, they I can see they haven't lost any hair. And it's okay. itchy to them where they rub their mouth on the carpet. And what would that be from? Okay, what kind of dog is this? What, well, what they're breed? just mixed from the pound. Okay, um, but uh, short nose, long nose? <laughs> I'm just trying to get a picture of, <laughs> well, picture okay. of the dog. Well, um, average, I guess I'm I, try- one is, um, well, they're both medium size, and one, they're both short hair, but okay. one of them uh, has a coat like a very short shepherd. Okay. And the other guess- one is a short coat like a, um, right. I, I don't know, like a, a Datsun, but they're mixed. Uh, I was told one was half um, husky and cattle dog, and the other okay. one they told me part shepherd and cattle dog. Okay, that helps me thinking about it. You know, certainly some of the dogs have some sensitivity there, and it could relate to food, getting crumbs of food, uh, maybe not being able to clean that off. I'm just trying to think of things I've seen in the past. Sometimes they will develop some little sores or little tiny abscesses. It would not hurt when a dog is having this problem to use a wipe like a chlorhexidine uh, antiseptic wipe to just routinely wipe the dog's chin off if that's where it's occurring. Okay. That might help, okay? Thank Uh, you so very much. Can probably get some of those for you. And good luck with that. Take care. Thanks for your call, Janice. We've got some open phone lines on this all pet day on Creature Comfort. So if you have a pet question or if you'd like to share with us a recent wildlife experience you had, give us a call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 
7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. So, Dr. Major, when it comes to litter boxes, I know your rule is one plus one for every cat. I can't remember how exactly you say it. Remind us again of your litter box rule. Right. If you have two cats or three cats, it's good to have one litter box per cat plus one extra one. In other words, so you would have four if you had three cats. All right. And so... By by reasoning. um, And also, the other thing is be sure to keep the litter boxes clean. But at least it gives the opportunity for the cats to go to a litter box, hopefully, that's clean. And some cats will go in any kind of litter box. It could be as dirty as it could be. Others, they say, hey, I'm going to go somewhere else. And it might be on your carpet or under the bed or somewhere like that. So I think the rule is pretty good. So when it comes to the type of litter, I know there's, you know, scoopable kinds and there's all a variety of litters. And especially if if you're just getting a new cat, what would your recommendations or tips and guidelines be for picking out a type of litter to use? Well, you know that uh, the experts say that cats would rather have soil like dirt rather rather than maybe than some of this fancy uh, litter. One of the things that I, I dislike is where they can track the litter out of the litter box uh, over the house. But the, clump, the clumping litter seems to work well for me, uh, and it's, it's good. Some cats do not like the perfumed litter. There'll be litter that has a smell to it. So a lot of cats would rather have just a regular litter. There's some coarser litters uh, that, that work. And uh, a lot of the litters are made from a clay-type uh, material, and it absorbs urine. I like the clumping litter just because you can scoop it out easily and clean the litter box with that. But uh, each cat has a difference, and some cats will like one type of litter over another. And then a final litter box question. What about the size of the litter box itself? Uh, big enough, I guess, for a cat to move around in. Uh, what small, short side, uh, long, uh, large size, uh, sides? What, what do you recommend there? I'd say adequate. I mean, if you have a 16, 17-pound cat, you need a pretty good-sized litter box. Uh, a lot of cats do not like to have the cover on the top of it. However, people like to have the cover on the top of it. Uh, and some cats, though, it will trap odor, and some cats don't like that. Uh, there's a me- they have mechanized. I'm sure you've seen it on TV. Mm-hmm. These fancy mechanized uh, litter boxes that supposedly work well, and the litter is, drops to the bottom. It works for some people, and others it doesn't. So I've seen those come and go over the years. But wise. Uh, just a standard size for most cats um, that you can get at your uh, pet store or wherever with that. All right. We've got some calls coming in, but we need to take one final break for this hour. It is an all-pet day. Dr. Major is ready to take your pet questions. Still time for you to work in a question if you have one, though. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven. 672-7464. Email animals at mpbonline.org. We'll wrap up the show with some phone calls after this. If you're print impaired, MPB's radio reading service is here for you. Our dedicated team of volunteers bring the world of news and entertainment to you. For information and to see if you qualify, call us at 601-432-6301. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. It is an all-pet day today, and we've got some phone lines to get to, so let's see if we can work our way through these final four calls, beginning again in Memphis. Lola is on the line. Good morning. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Good morning, doctor. How are you? Good morning. Doing good. Listen, I, I really don't know the, the type of dog I have. It was given to me, but it's got short hair and big brown eyes. He's got and his uh his color of his fur is 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 about the same color. It's like a reddish brown color, floppy ears. Anyway, what, the, my dog is licking excessively on his feet and his eyes some, are sometimes running 
and he shakes. I mean, he just shakes all over excessively, and and it's it's annoying, <laughs> but he does it. And um, I was wondering what what would probably be the cause of this. All right. Let's think about the shaking first. You're saying that his whole body shakes. Yes. Right. I mean, yes. And, but it's not like a nervous twitch or something like that. No, it's not like a nervous twitch. I mean, his whole little body just shakes. Okay, okay. As far as the uh, licking, we we talked a little bit about licking the paws. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that cer- certainly going outside, if he goes outside, uh, he can be sensitive to grass. Really, as long as there's no irritation to his feet, no sores that he's mm-hmm. created. no. No. Probably it's not a lot that you can do. Um, as okay. I advised the, the person earlier, a uh, good vitamin mix, uh, uh, a vitamin tablet, certainly uh, designed for dogs, might might help that. Um, his eyes. What's the name of that, sir? Uh, there's Vitamidor? one called just, just Pet Tabs, which is one of the ones as far as the vitamins. Okay. Now, uh, okay. the eyes, are they runny or irritated? You said something. Runny. Something. Yeah. And this may be an allergy as well. Uh, certainly. If, it's an inside dog. Right. But he goes outside some. Yes, sir, he does. Yeah, yeah. So he may be coming in contact with something. Uh, you know, the simplest thing probably would be to do a trial with some Benadryl. Uh, just to see if that helps. Uh, okay. After that, uh, what is what does he weigh? As far as his weight? Uh, roughly maybe maybe fifty pounds. Okay. You know, a twenty-five milligram Benadryl would not hurt. You could do it twice a day for a few days and see if that helps. Uh, okay. After that, I would advise seeing your vet really rather than me trying to treat over the phone. So you can certainly try that without causing any problem. But try the okay. vitamin, too. I think that would help. Okay? Okay. Hit bite. Thank you. I really appreciate you, sir. Thank you. Well, right. You're welcome. Take care. Thanks, Lola. Let's uh, move on next. It's our buddy TJ from Kosciuszko. Good morning, TJ. You're on the air. Yeah, I love y'all's show. I just wanted to brag on uh, how much we love our Boston Terrier. All right. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about him. Well, you know, if you're retired and you want a companion puppy, a dog, a Boston Terrier. We had one for years. They are such loyal, sweet, loving dogs, aren't they? But they'll also wear you out, too. They love to play. <laughs> and that's, that's good. That's good. I like that. But, yes, they're, they're – I guess the question may be not quite right, or the answer would be they're vivacious. They – <laughs> they bounce, they bounce, they love attention, and they give give good kisses, too. They they like to lick you. <laughs> Do you have other dogs? We found that our the Boston Terrier, we sometimes had other dogs when we had had her, but she didn't like any other dogs. <laughs> they're, they're, one, they're one dog, yeah. <laughs> and they do lick. <laughs> All right. I will lick. <laughs> All right, uh, TJ. Hey, What's your dog's name, TJ? Coal. All right. Coal. Like coleslaw. <laughs> okay. I'm right. worried. Good. Thanks, TJ, for your call. Let's move on next. We'll go to uh, Lori calling in from Indianola. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Yes. Um, I have a rescue five months old from a litter of seven, and she eats just the way the previous caller described. Yes, ma'am. And she gets a hiccup. Is that from eating too fast? Quite often it can be. Now, dogs will have hiccups, sometimes for no apparent reason, just like people do. But if she's eating too fast, certainly it can cause that. And sometimes the dogs may throw up after eating too fast if they eat too much. So. Well, I have another question, which is about um, riding in the car. Even on a 15-minute trip, she salivates excessively. And then on a two-hour trip, she has salivated and thrown up. So what what can we do? Will she grow out of it? Usually they do. I have seen some dogs that 
don't. You can talk to your vet. There are some things that you could give for a long trip, you know, where it would help, uh, and just a tablet uh, that, that might help. Uh, but it is a problem, and you're doing the right thing if you can take her on a 5- to 10-minute trip just to, and give her a reward or something when you get home if she hasn't salivated or thrown up. But certainly that would be, that would be uh, the best way I know to do it and maybe have somebody with you where they can kind of entertain her while you're driving. Okay. Thanks so much. Make, make, make it pleasurable. That's the main thing. Okay. Okay. Thank you're you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Uh, about two minutes left. One final call to get to. Charlie is on the line. Good morning, Charlie. You're on the air. Hey, how y'all doing? I got a quick question for Libby. Um, okay. We've had Prathana Cherry Warbler's nest for five years in a row. And last year... I didn't even see it. I'm just curious if you knew of any other uh, situations like that around or how they turned out at Lafleur's Bluff this year because I know they monitor them there. They they did have a good population at Lafleur's Bluff this year, I know, because I read a report that they did, and they, we, we had uh, good nests on the Fanny Cook Natural Area. I did not have as many as I have had some years. It may be, you know, they, they're... I don't think enough research has been done on those birds to know for sure, but it's thought that they come back, um, that adults may come back to where they were babies. If you had a year in the past that uh, didn't do well nesting and the nestlings didn't make it, then you wouldn't have those birds to come back. So something like that could have happened in the past. Um, But let's hope this year you get them. I'm hoping I will. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah. Well, have a good day. All right. Thanks, Charlie, for that phone call. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Just time to remind you that this Saturday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., the Fossil Road Show is back at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, uh, back in person, so everyone is encouraged to attend and bring their fossil discoveries. If you need more information, you can search the website for the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. That's mdwfp.com. And I always like to remind you that if you've seen something that you want to snap a picture of it, get that smartphone out, try to get a picture of it. When you send it in, we'll get our team of experts to study it and see if we can't tell you what you found. Creature Conference is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio. Funding provided in part by listeners. Today's show was produced by Java Chapman, and our call screener was Liz Gill. So for Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield, I'm Kevin Farrell. Stay tuned. Up next, it's AutoCorrect. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Comforts, heard only on MPB Think Radio.